Bonjour à tous, merci d'être là pour ce euh, travail. Je vous présente, c'est Ali euh, Hossein Talimé, qui est un professeur assistant à l'Université de Bagdad. Il a obtenu son diplôme premièrement de l'Université de Naraïm à Bagdad. Oui, il a eu son doctorat au Centre de robotique et des systèmes neuronaux en Angleterre. Et il travaille actuellement sur l'analyse, le traitement et la classification des signaux biomodicaux en vue de faire des prothèses, d'améliorer la partie contrôle-commande des prothèses pour l'humain. Vous savez que l'Irak, malheureusement, a été touché par la guerre et il y en a pas mal de personnes qui sont touchées par un endroitement, par des membres supérieurs qui sont embêtés. Donc, il fait ce travail dans ce cadre-là. Il, il est arrivé au long en 2019 dans un cadre d'échange international pour une deux semaines qui a permis de commencer, d'initier quelques travaux en remplaçant les signaux EMG par des signaux acoustiques, pour voir est-ce qu'on peut faire quelque chose à partir des signaux acoustiques. Et puis, le projet est un nouveau projet a été monté en collaboration avec Slim aussi, qui est un groupe qui vient d'utiliser le SAT, qui travaille aussi sur des signaux biomédicaux. Donc, dans le même cadre, on a monté avec Cousin un projet avec les WISE, et ils sont là chez nous, Slim, pour deux semaines, et aller il était depuis arriver depuis début février pour six semaines. Donc, deux semaines, il nous quittera. Donc, merci. Thank you, Monsieur, for this uh, nice introduction in French. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ariel Tibiri. I'm an associate professor at the University of Baghdad. I'm also a visit professor to the University of Plymouth in the UK while I did my PhD. It, it gives me a great pleasure to be here today. Thanks to Long and Ensign and also French Embassy in Baghdad and Campus France to uh, help us in this project. So I'm doing this project in collaboration with my team, uh, Prof. Rauf and Prof. Yaqub, and uh, Dr. Youssef, and also our colleague in machine learning from Australia, Dr. Rabi Kachar. So my talk will be about acoustic myography for upper limb prosthesis control. Since long, long main interest is acoustics, so now we are showing some application going towards biomedical application and how to we could improve disabled people's life. So uh, as I as you mentioned, I did my PhD in the UK and uh, I work on mainly upper limb prosthesis control with machine learning and electromyography or muscle signals. And we have been, we published in this field many papers, key papers, and we also collected many data sets from amputees and we make it available for everyone. So uh, where I live, uh, Iraq is the city of Etabia, and everybody knows. And I live 50 miles north of Babylon. And here you can see the street of Ishtar Gate from the of Babylon. And I also work for al khwarizm College of Engineering, the name of my school. And uh, the name of al khwarizm is the famous Muslim mathematician who invented the Arab Hindu numerals. And also he introduced the field of algebra. So my school has the name of Al-Khwarizmi, even the word algorithm took uh, its name from the Al-Khwarizmi. So uh, what I will show you today is in this talk, so I will show you, I speak briefly about the worldwide amputation problem and what are the challenges with the existing control algorithms to control the processes. And I will also show our pilot pioneering result for the acoustic myograph, the signal recorded from the muscles with acoustic sensors, and I will show you where we reached and what's our future work for the work did here in Lom and Pisa. So let's start with the reduced disability problems. There are many people around the world who lost an upper limb due to many reasons, such as wars, accidents, or, or due to a trauma by diabetes and lipids. To, losing an upper limb will cause a disability, but also lose, causing dexterity to be lost. Not only that, it will also cause a psychological problem to the patient. To bring those people back to normal life, there are a partial solution, which is the commercially available prosthesis, like the one shown in the picture. This prosthesis could do very limited number of movements, open and close. Despite that, this could help amputees to gain some functionality that they lost after the losing a limb. To control this, this is a very primitive uh, prosthetic hand. This is worked by the body, body movement. So we have a silk attached to the shoulder, and if we pull the prosthesis open, if we lose, it, it's closed. This is a pure mechanical prosthetic hand, but it could help the guy to drink water and perform some uh, daily tasks, such as tying a shoe. 
So open close with the body movement, pure mechanical, no control. So the, the better state of the art than this one is the control processes by the muscle signals. So for like the one that we see here. So this, we pick up the signals coming from the remaining limb and we try to open and close the movement. But this technology, despite being primitive, it's very expensive. This cost, I will, show, I will tell you in the next slide how much this can cost. What are the components of the prosthetic hand? Two parts. The main part is the megatronic part, which has the all mechanical parts in addition to the electronics. And the other part is the control, how we could take a signal from the amputee and drive the prosthetic hand. Many advantages have many state-of-the-art techniques, many advances on the, on the other side, the mechatronic part. So we have dexterous hands from a companies com commercially available. They could move each individual finger individually in addition to rotation. But this technology is not cheap. Started from 25K till 100K. So it is not affordable to everyone on the other side. On the other hand, available, the availability of 3D printing technology and scientists and inventors around the world they invented many good dexterous hands and they made the design available for everyone. So if you want, you could just take the tact hands, bring the file, see the design by the motors, assemble it yourself. Very good, the hands could do many movements and the price around one-tenth of one-tenth and some of them is only 1,000 euro. You could do it yourself compared to 25,000 euros. I can't say these are better than these, but the functionality of these hands are comparable or somehow how for one hundredth of the price. But where is the, what are the challenge with the control? You have the hand that could do many movements, but you cannot control it. You don't have a command from the amputee to drive these. And this is a, a design open source from a, just to show you what are the components. You could uh, download the files, print them yourself, and build a robotic hand yourself uh, for a thousand euro. It's called Open Hand Project. And there are many versions available better than this one. So, how to control the prosthetic hand? What we do, we put uh, sensors around the muscles and we pick up the electrical signal. When you think of closing your hand, the brain sends a signal to the muscle and then the muscle contracts and then you do the movement. They found that even the, if the hand is amputated, the muscle signal is still there. So we pick up the signal and as you see in the red, uh, red uh, figure here, the more signal you show, the, the higher the amplitude of the signal is. So what we do, I do a small movement, I close the hand, I do a stronger movement, I open the hand. As simple as that, okay? And this is valid even for the amputee if he just got small part left after, after the amputation. And I will show you a video. This is the basic control. If you want to more movements like open, close, rotate, finger movement, then this threshold based control is not enough. You need a, a machine learning or path recognition. And uh, in this video, I will show you how, how the uh, simple processes work. So you do the movement, you pick up the signal, we use amplifier and filter to amplify it upstairs. And then we change it to a analog digital converter and we detect the movement done by the subject. And then we will drive the robotic hand to do the movement. Okay? I will show you again in case if you miss the signal. So the subject control, we pick up the signal, amplify it and filter it a thousand times, and then we detect this flap, and the signal processing will detect that, and then we derive the robotic hand to do close. If the signal is stronger, then we will do open the hand and open. This is the basic to control one or two movements. What about if I want to control five movements, then this approach is not enough. We use machine learning by putting more electrodes, more sensors. Instead of having one sensor, we will put five, six, seven, and we will take all of these and uh, we do amplifications, filtering, and then we use this paradigm of machine learning, segment the window, small windows of the signal, and then we extract features and we use a classifier and then we have a decision at this stage, one or two or three or four. So I'm thinking of closing my hand and the robotic hand will have a decision from a classifier, close the hand. And this should be done 
within like quarter of a second. Otherwise, it will be the subject will notice a delay, like the, the mobile phone. If you, you, you do a movement and the response time is very slow, then you will abandon the phone. The same thing for the processes. 250 milliseconds is the time from contracting the movement, so it should be performed by the robotic arm. What this is so far is good, working well, expensive, but uh, there are challenges with this one. What are the challenges? I will show them in the next slide. By the way, you may ask this question. I got the hand amputated. Uh, how I could think of closing my hand if I don't have the hand, right? So I will show you some videos for, uh, for amputees. This is a guy, transfer the amputees. We put electrodes, and I'm trying to explain to him to help him to imagine doing this movement for the finger. There is no finger, okay? And we will see the signals on the screen as I will show you the video. So I'm telling him he's using the other hand to try to, to help him to imagine with little focus and concentration. So he will try to imagine doing this movement. And look at the live view screen. You will see the amplitude of the signals increased from the remaining part of, the, of this time. See? And he's a bit pressed. Contraction. Pressed. Just the finger. There is no. It's called phantom imagination. And he was able to imagine 12 movements. This one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. With a little training for 30 minutes, the signal was very good after the... So we take these signals, machine learning, and you could decide what we could do with it. Not only that, the other guy as well is a different guy. Also, he got a transfer and amputation. So he tried to do this movement as well. And you see very strong signals are appear even there is no time. Uh, the reason we showed you here in this video speaking about the fingers, hard movements generally are gross movement, very strong. So if we do a movement, we see a big signals. But for the finger, they are very tiny and minute. So if the, we were able to imagine these, then the hard movement by default should be easier. So, and then nowadays, uh, if we want, since we said we have this good megatronics, robotic hands, so we need a good control to enable us to control these, to enable the subject to do daily living, like eating, drinking, tying his shoe, for instance, going to the toilet, and at least we need this movement, just the index finger, to use the mobile and also to use a laptop for typing. So this is a simple movement, but it's very useful in daily life for deputies, for a mobile, for a laptop. So what are the challenges with the signal that I showed you? Its amplitude is very small, and this is in terms of microvolt, and it's highly contaminated by noise, power line, electromagnetic noise, motion artifact, not only that, we need to place the electrode in a very good place. And finally, you need a specific setup to acquire it. So all of these challenges uh, for the electrical muscle signals. So the objective from our work is to try to find an alternative signal that could give us the same uh, performance to control processes similar to the electrical muscles, which is called EMG. So we ask two fundamental research questions. Our hypothesis is that, can we hear the sound of the muscle if we put high sensitive microphones on the muscle? One, and if, if we got this signal, can we use it to control processes? So this is the, the main focus that we've done, three experiments that we will show you with my team about this. And the signal here, we will call it, instead of electromyography, myo is a Latin for muscle, graphy is a graph, and electro is the electrical signal. Here we name it or, or give the term acoustic because it is a muscle sound, basically. So the work here done in three phases, phase one, 2019, and phase two uh, last year and the work we've been doing for the last, last month. So what we uh, try, try to do, try to put high sensitive microphones on the muscle and do a movement and see if we could hear something. So Hussein has an idea of, let's bring this high sensitive microphone, 500 euros, with a Rolls Royce National Instrument data acquisition, and put it on the muscles, and then do a movement. And can we detect something? Can we hear something? So we've done a pilot work on how to fix the microphones on the uh, muscles. So we bought a sponge for the working, and we cut small pieces 
and we make like an easy mount, and we fix them with a duct tape on the muscle, and we ask the subject to produce a couple of movements, and we recorded the signals that we, what we did done in 2019. Well, we hear some, some sounds. So this is here, seven, six movements. As you see, there's a contraction, and then the signal declines with the, with the, with the contraction. And we've done finger movements, and movement, rotation, and not only that, this is one subject, and this is for the second subject as well. So we hear the sound of the muscles for the first time. But the signal output was small, and for a long time, it didn't continue, because we put them directly on the muscle. Phase two, what we try to do, we try to improve the signal to noise ratio for the signal. So, and do more movements to see if we could improve it, to get a bigger signal that we could use for process control. So we use the same hardware, same condenser microphones with the same national instruments hardware. And here we try to make a acoustic chamber. We put on the muscle by, by sponge and to see if we could improve it. So we vary the dis distance between the muscle and the uh, microphone. And by creating this acoustic chamber, I will show you what happened. So this was the setup that my colleague made. And you will see here, signal quality improved around five times than the previous one. And for instance, here, the subject is doing hand closed. And here, doing finger movements. If you show this to a guy expert in the muscle signals, or he will say this is electromyography, not acoustic. So this was promising. And also, uh, what are the frequency of, uh, of the signal that we recorded? It is a sound. Can you guess the frequency? Usually the sound is recorded at high frequency, right? Well, 10K something. But for these muscle signals, the tiny, minute, can you guess a number? No wrong answer. Five hertz, good guess. Two. Two hertz, this is the lower cut, okay, good. How about the bigger, higher end for the muscle sounds? Four. Four hertz. So uh, we found that it is below 100 hertz. We recorded here at 10K centigrade. And the main components for the signal is around two, four, good guess, still like 40, 30. And here we have different movements, and the spectrum was different for each movement. So the maximum frequency you get for all hand movements around 100 hertz. Okay. So and the signal quality improved from the previous one. So so far, we shown that we could detect it. It is useful, and there are some variation between the signal that we could use to detect the movement to control processes, as I explained earlier. The last phase. Now we want to like make a formal experiment to put it on the arms, the core signal, do a movement. And this is not feasible to use the sponge and the caustic chamber. So we designed a caustic chambers, 3D printed, that could the microphone from one end could fit in this. And the, on the other end, we have a cone shape to amplify the sound. So we made four of these and we assembled them in a wristband that, that, that you could wear and do the movement very easily. And now I will show you how much this improved the uh, signal quality from the previous version in, in the world. So we put them around the forearm tight, and we asked the subject to do a couple of finger and hand movements. And here we could see one of our volunteers uh, using the lab use screen and doing finger movement. And you could see the signal quality better than the previous chamber that we made. And here I will show you a video for the four channels that we made, performing, subject performing, couple of movements. This is this muscle sound, you see it for the first time, like one, two, other movement. Each one has a different distinct amplitude and location. The location for the muscles varies. So you see, and you will see also for the finger movements, you see the signal, very good detected signal. Of course, we could hear this by transferring to a microphone, but I could I can do this here. And here is the signal for the, the one that we see previously. So this is the subject doing nine contractions of a hand close, and we see the amplitude much better than the previous one. Not only that, also you could tell the amplitude is bigger. This is the same subject doing the same movement, but the amplitude is different. Why is that? If I put these four here, 
And for instance, channel two is near the muscle that I'm doing. I expect to have higher amplitude, while channel four is away from the muscle. I hear something, but it's less than the other because all uh, signals have the same scale, okay? So signal is ratio improved, and this is very promising to be used for process control. And again, if I show this to a guy who expert in muscle signals, he will say this is EMG, not AMG, because it looks very similar and the quality is good. So what we do with these, if you remember the machine learning and pattern recognition paradigm that I showed you, we'll just skip the EMG and we put AMG. And on the same, same paradigm, we do feature extraction, classification. So I'm doing the movement, record the sound, and the processes or the classifier should give me an output to the movement I, I've done. We've done experiments for six movements. Uh, so we try to use six movements from three subjects, and we use machine learning, and I will show you the results, how much we got. Uh, this is a scatter plot for the features that we extracted for a subject who's done six movements. And you could see in the scatter plot, very good class separability. So the class movements are different for each one, which shows the potential of this method to have a good classification accuracy because of this scatter plot. So the result that we got from three subjects, uh, we got around 85% accuracy, which is very promising. The previous work done 80%, 70%. So the three subjects done six movements and we were able to take them with 85% accuracy. Of course, the six movements, some of them are bad. So we removed just one movement, bad movement, and the accuracy improved to 90% from all subjects. So this is very promising with only four channels because usually people use more than four, eight, six, eight. So what we will do in the, in the next or, or future research direction for our work, so we will try to investigate different locations of the forearm, where to place the electrodes. Because if I place them away, I have a small signal. If I place them four next to the uh, bigger part of the muscle, I have a bigger signal. This is what we'd like to investigate with the use of hand elevator. This is one part. And also uh, for the future, we would like to test this on amputees. So we, we remove the muscle signals and we want to test the acoustic biography for amputees to see if they are able to produce muscle uh, signals for the acoustics. So to do that, we will build, uh, try to build small mounts and use uh, smaller microphones that uh, we could uh, integrate into uh, like a device and collect data from people with uh, disability. And uh, in Iraq, there are many disabilities from all types, transradial, elbow, transhumoral, and even the guy without the shoulder. So a variety of people with that you could test in the study of the muscle signals. So now uh, what we wanted to do, we want to build the system here in Lom to try to record more signals, eight microphones. So work on progress in, the, in these two weeks. So we constructed eight mounts and we use a better or bigger hardware data composition with the software. And we've done a pilot uh, work yesterday for eight microphones and repeat not six movements, 14 movements and see how our system, because we have more input, how our system will do for the 14 movements. And I have a video here to show you the eight, eight channels. And you see the signals are very good. And the subject is doing variety of finger movements, hand movements, uh, wrist movements, and all very detectable from all parts of the channels, depending on where the channel is near which muscle. So we have the hardware, the mounts ready, microphones ready, the data acquisition, natural <coughs> instruments ready, and the software ready. So we will just, uh, and if you'd like to come to volunteer for the experiment, uh, we welcome you on the next week. So the conclusion from my talk that we showed that acoustic myography or AMG is a very promising tool that we could detect muscle signals. One application particularly we are interested in is the, to use it for process control with pattern recognition and, and muscle signals. Other uses for AMG, we could use it to detect uh, muscle fatigue and we could use it also to detect diseases or other diseases, but we need a collaboration with the hospital to show us how we could uh, to provide patients that you could test our hardware. 
So uh, in total, if you remember the start of my talk, I said the megatronic part with open uh, 3D printed open technology and the control part. So with the microphones, simple signal, and also with the 3D printed hand, we could have an integrated solution that could help uh, amputees and disabled people and to do daily life activities. So uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge everybody who helped us in this study, volunteers, technicians, doctors, everybody, and also all the people who supported us, especially LOM, INSEM, uh, RISE, Campus France, and the French Embassy in Baghdad. So thank you very much for your uh, listening and for attending the seminar. And I, I wish that uh, you visit us one, once in Iraq. This is the Tower of the University of Baghdad and to do collaboration and uh, do future research. Thank you very much for your interest. And if you have any questions, I will be delighted to answer.